and I would have had about 30 hours in the air. But when I came to Sydney, uh, I set a couple of endurance records on Botany Bay, which would, and plus other flying on uh, the Hawkesbury River, would have taken me up to another 10 hours. So all told, when uh, in, in the end of 67, or 69 anyway, when I stopped flying, I had about 40 hours in the air. So were there times where either you overflew the rope, or the rope failed, or you deliberately released the rope? Uh, can you describe the, 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 the number of times or amount of time that, that you might have flown not under tow? Uh, initially, we, we flew under tow and landed under tow right through to uh, around March 1964. And uh, we, for a long while, we didn't have any releases either on the boat or uh, the wing and due to an accident, uh, we, we developed releases. Uh, but from around uh, February, March, would have been March 1964, we chose to, we became expert with the gliding and we chose to release from the rope. Typically, uh, we're using two ski ropes that meet uh, 140 feet long. We wouldn't be right over the top of the boat, but we certainly would have been from 100 feet or so. And we'd release from the, from the rope, glide down, and um, eventually we would have very elegant landings on the ski, ski to the water, water's edge, step off the ski like supermen, and it, that's what we did all the time from that time on. Except for that one time when you went into the bull rushes. Could you tell me about that? <laughs> yes, this is my very last flight, which was supposed to be perfect in every way. It was a beautiful sunny day. There was no wind to speak of. Um, I was in the air for probably 15 minutes before, we, before the Jacaranda crowd, November 1965. I went over to the far side of the river, which is something over half a mile wide climbed to the top of the rope, 140 feet, um, nodded to indicate to the boat I wanted maximum speed. And I uh, then put it into a dive. I was probably doing 45 miles an hour. Did a slow S curve as it traveled towards the uh, beach where we normally launch from. The intention was to do one of these elegant landings on the single ski, step off like a hero at the other end realised I was going to arrive at the beach with 18 inches of, uh, of uh, height between me and the ski. We're still doing nearly 30 miles an hour and I had no choice but to put the, the glider on its wingtip, do a smart turn around that wingtip and then cartwheeled right along the side of the wall underneath the announcer uh, in amongst the bull rushes. <laughs> picked myself out of there, spitting bulrushes and things, and the announcer, a guy called Val Preston, said with great aplomb, what a spectacular end to a spectacular flight. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, it wasn't on, on camera. Um, I, I, I meant to ask, um, uh, what did you choose to build your airframe from? Uh, why, and at what point, and why did you switch uh, airframe materials? The airframe material, uh, the, the keel leaning edges were of Oregon timber, I think you call it Douglas fir here. Uh, the tube that was the main spar was part of a television uh, mast, it was aluminium, 16 gauge, one and a half inch diameter outside of it. The, the fittings like the A-frame or the material the frames were made from were from the scrap heap and the wiring was from television aerial straining wires and the uh, fabric was taken from um, banana bags, the blue plastic which comes in rolls. So it had a plastic uh, wing stuck together with sticky tape. It cost me uh, what was 12 pounds in Australian money at that time which was the equivalent to two American dollars, it would have been twenty-four dollars to build it. And why did you and and why yeah why did you switch to uh, aluminum and, and did you also switch to a uh, uh, cloth sail uh, around the same time? Uh, to, to to do a better job 
of the thing. I mean, I, I was trying to build something to aircraft standards, whereas the other device was a flying heap of junk. Um, in the March, I think you said, of, was it March of 67 that you uh, you had the opportunity to meet uh, either Bill Bennett or Bill Moyes or both, and could you tell us about how you met them and, um, and, and what they knew about flying at that point? Uh, I can't really say what they knew about flying at that point, but they both... Actually, I'm sorry, if you could re say who you're referring to, I first met... They could, yeah, I'm sorry. I first met uh, Bill Moyes and Bill Bennett in, uh, 19, in around March 1967. Uh, they were interested in purchasing one of my wings. I'd made an arrangement with a chap called Mike Burns who was building a ski plane at that time based on uh, the Delta Biconical wing. And he had the facilities to manufacture them. So I was demonstrating that wing to anybody that was interested. They made an appointment with uh, Mike Burns and myself to meet on the Hawkesbury River and to have a trial flight. And that's how I got to meet these two guys. Did, did uh, uh, you met them at the same time? Did they knew each other already? They, they were friends, as I understood. Um, but, uh, do you think they knew about your work uh, in, in advance of you meeting them? Uh, I was told later on by what I would call a reliable source that they had been watching me fly and were interested in uh, getting getting their hands on one uh, to, to also fly. And Bill Bennett, I understand, was flying ski kites prior to meeting me, the old, the old shield show. Um, so you could, you uh, you work you sold gliders to them. Uh, you uh, continued to work with them. Can you describe how your continuing work with them, and, or what your what your continuing relationship was, uh, say up through '69 uh, or so? Uh, yes, uh, uh, they. I don't know whether Bennett bought a glider, but I certainly know that Bill Moyes uh, built a glider. My um, patent applied for had run out. I also had moved back to Sydney and was in uh, had quite a lot of uh, financial problems because, well, just moving back to Sydney, I, I lost a lot of money. So I could see I couldn't do any any more development with it, but particularly with Bill, Bill Moyes, I could see in him somebody that was going to take. Uh, my dream of this device eventually being powered and going around the world uh, in this man, and so I assisted him as best I could. Uh, this went on to 1969 when circumstances caused me to walk away from it, and, and I, I, I stopped flying in 1969. I had a relationship with Bill that went on to about 1973 where I was advising him technically on uh, some of the problems he was getting with the wing. There's a 19, I thought it was 1980 article in Hang Gliding Magazine that uh, about a wing that you and Bill Boys had uh, a hand in. Um, you familiar with the, which article I'm talking about? I thought that was 1980. Uh, no, I'm not. Oh, hang on. Yes, around 1980 I was actually out of work. And uh, I thought maybe I could get back into to the designing sides of things, and I actually uh, designed a, uh, a rigid wing, which I called the frigate, and uh, Bill Moyes built, built an example of it, and um, I actually flew that wing, a uh, foot launch it off a sand hill at Botany Bay. It flew very well, it felt very much like a, um, one of my earlier wings, but uh, it was complex, complex to build, and it took a lot of work to assemble and disassemble on the site. And, uh, and uh, Bill decided not to go on with it. I almost forgot about that. In fact. Bill must have had a, uh, a pretty good idea of your design ability to uh, invest the, uh, the amount of money that it would have taken to build the original one. You must have had a high expectation based on good experience that you would be able to produce something that, that would 
warrant him spending the money on that way? Uh, by 1980, I would have to believe that he was a millionaire from the sales that he had a worldwide organization. So the cost of building the wing may have been only two or three hundred dollars at the most of his peanuts. Let's start that one.